Hello, <laughs> welcome um, to the Sound Arts Lecture Series hosted here at the London College of Communication in association with CRISAP, Creative Research into Sound Arts Practice Centre that's also at LCC. Um, as many of you know, I'm Mark Peter Wright. I'm the acting course leader for the BA Sound Arts at the moment, and I'm also a member of CRISAP. And I put this term's um, guest speakers together for you, so I hope um, you enjoy them all. And I'm delighted today that Johan Diedrich is with us and will be sharing his brilliant work and I'll introduce Johan shortly. Um, but before that, I will go through some housekeeping bits that I, I do every week um, and also remind us that this is a very unique space in that it contains undergraduate students, postgraduates, PhDs and members of the public. So, and I think there's quite a lot of, of that mixture here today, which is lovely. So. Um, that's great. Next slide, please, Roy, or Eka, whoever's pressing the button. Eka, great, thank you. <laughs> um, so within this mix, if you are a UAL student, as I say every week, um, please put your full name in the username for registration purposes, but also um, just so we can identify you. Um, Pre-registered, so external guests. Um, if we can't identify you, you might be asked to leave. So please just put your, your name um, in there. Uh, next slide, Eka. And just be mindful, this is a public forum. Uh, the chat message is archived, which is a lovely way to remember that this is a public forum. Uh, microphones are off and uh, we recommend speak of you, but I think this is always a kind of default anyway. So um, yeah, next slide, please. So for um, students, you can take out your phone and scan the QR code. The password is SK1BE8. I will pop that in the chat afterwards if I remember. Please don't get stressed about this if your phone doesn't work or you can't do it, don't worry, it's, it's fine. Um, okay, next slide, thank you all. So just another note about the question and answer session. Um, you all know it's a great opportunity to ask visiting practitioners questions and we just always say this, a question can be a very straightforward thing, don't, don't overcomplicate things, it doesn't have to be um, genius level, um, you can just want to know more about a certain topic. So um, yeah, store them up, use the chat almost like a memory log if you want to write into it continually um, as a generative space. And um, if you can try to try to just pop in the chat that you'll be happy to ask the question. If not, I'll do like a private message and see if you want to ask it. If, and if you don't want to, I'll obviously ask it on your behalf. Um, okay, next slide please, Eka. And just a reminder for students, I think you will know this by now. Um, you can find all the links for the whole term in Moodle, Sound Arts Lecture Series block. You go into this page here, and then where the highlight is, there is all the series in there with the links. Um, and that is across BA, MA and PhD Moodle sites now. Okay, now we're at the good stuff. Next slide, please, Eka. So, Johan is a, an awarding an artist, engineer and musician, makes installations, performances and sculptures for experience in the world through Sonic Encounter. He surfaces resonant histories of past interactions inscribed in material and embedded in space, peeling back vibratory layers to reveal hidden memories and untold stories. He shares his tools and techniques through listening tours, workshops and open source hardware software, and is the founder of A Quiet Life, a sonic engineering and research studio that designs and builds audio related software and hardware products for revealing new sonic possibilities off the grid. He's the Director of Engineering at Somewhere Good, a 2022 Future Imagination Collaboratory Fellow at the Tisch School of Arts in New York, a 2022 Wave Farm Artist in Residence, or Residence, could be Residence as well, um, a 2021 Mozilla Creative Media Award recipient, a 2020 Pioneer Works Technology Residence, a community member of New Inc, and an adjunct professor at NYU's ITP program. And Johan's work has been featured in The Wire, Music Works, presented internationally at MoMA, PS1, New Museum, Science Gallery Dublin, Somerset House, loads and loads of brilliant places. And 
I won't keep going. And I, instead, I will hand you over to Johan, who is going to generously share his work with us all now. Awesome. Thank you so much for the intro, Mark. And thank you, everyone. Give me one moment to share my screen and get uh, slides up and running. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Or I, I probably can even see if someone can acknowledge that. <laughs> Looks good? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me full screen this. Okay. And let's go. All right. So, um, hello and welcome. First, I'd like to thank Chris App, the London College of Communication, and the University of the Arts London. Um, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Mark Peter Wright for the invitation to speak um, to you all today. As I mentioned in our correspondence, Chris App has been one of the most inspirational centers of sonic thought throughout my career. I was stunned, humbled, and I feel so grateful for the invitation to speak. And I'm so looking forward to spending some time with you all in conversation um, this morning slash afternoon, depending on where you are. Just as a quick overview, this talk will last around 90 minutes. Um, it's gonna be com comprised of three main sections, an intro, a case study, or a set of case studies, depending on how things go, and some early thoughts and writing on a theoretical framework called Sonic Encounter. Um, there'll be a few moments of extended listening throughout the talk lecture presentation, so please feel free to make yourselves comfortable. Okay. Um, before moving on any further, I'd like to take a moment to do a land acknowledgement, which in this context is a bit of a challenge. Given that we are all convening remotely and are somehow all suspended temporarily in some kind of proto meta space virtual plane where ideas of land and even place are made fuzzy as our avatars floating together, or as our avatars are floating together in some networked ether. Where are we exactly? In my apartment? On your computer? Somewhere in the electromagnetic mesh that facilitates this connectivity? This fuzziness and conflation of here and there makes it challenging to decide on a where from which to acknowledge, as we are not in the same physical place, and yet we have been placed together somehow temporarily. And yet I remain tethered to a place, and through the miracle of electronic communication, I am able to broadcast out to you. And so I will begin in or at the here in which I am situated. I'm here in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, New York, also known as Lenape Hokang, the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape, the Lenape people. This land, and particularly this neighborhood, is storied for many reasons. And I've learned some of these stories by turning my ears to the underwater rumblings, the industrial gnashings, and the overhead zoomings that make up the sonic environment surrounding the Newtown Creek, a body of water that defines Greenpoint, where I am, and separates Brooklyn and Queens. It also happens to be one of the most polluted Superfund sites in this country. The creek is infamously known um, for the Greenpoint oil spill, where somewhere around 17 to 30 million gallons of oil and petroleum products seep into the creek bed over the span of decades, only to be discovered by a Coast Guard patrol helicopter in 1978. Since being designated as a federal Superfund site in 2010, Many environmental remediation projects in this area aim to clean up the water and its surrounding ecosystem. Still, the area remains environmentally compromised due to industrialization, continued oil pollution from nearby refineries, combined sewage overflow events that regularly dump human waste into the creek and run off from cars and trucks that drive across its busy streets, bridges, and highways that pass over and through the area. Despite this, the area piques my curiosity as both a harbinger of climate crisis at our footsteps and also as a potential stage for how we might learn to coexist with such a present future. Sonically, I'm drawn to the whooshing of cars that pass above on the Long Island Expressway, 
the stochastic bubblings of aeration systems meant to reoxygenate the murky waters and the resilient wildlife that still makes this one vibrant marshland home. If you're lucky, you may catch a glimpse of a stray egret searching for food among patches of sawgrass planted by ecological restoration projects. Crabs, jellyfish, and the occasional seal still swim below the creek's still surface. Closer to the nearby, to a nearby FedEx distribution center, um, cacophonous calls of birds suggest an area that isn't so devoid of wildlife after all. Shown here in this photo is a work of mine called Cerulean Waters, a sound work that attends to the creek through an interweaving of music, field recording, and storytelling. Cascading between original music composition and hydrophonic field recordings, the work reveals the area's post-industrial present, its storied past, and its uncertain future through audio, recording, audio recordings taken while boating along its water and walking around its neighboring streets at night. The work features original music composition inspired by the waterway, weaving in underwater field recordings and voiceovers by local historian Mitch Waxman, who talks about the development of the area from a small residential neighborhood to the center of industrial gas and oil refinement. The sounds of waste management trucks, industrial cranes, and cars zooming past overhead on highways offer a stark reminder of how a former marshland was paved over and dredged from below in order to create a paradise for toxic dumping, rapid development, and unrestra unrestrained activities that negatively impacted a local ecosystem. Cerulean Waters invites us to contemplate the creek's history, consider its present situation within New York City's sonic ecosystem, and speculate on its future. And so as a way to acknowledge the land that I have been in knowing of, I'd like to play Cerulean Waters in its entirety, which is gonna be about 13 minutes, as a way to help situate us in the place, the land from which I'm reaching out to you from. So I'm gonna um, play this piece about 50, uh, 13 minutes long. So um, feel free to um, sit back and enjoy, and then I'll come back afterwards. It's uh, like the Dictian cave in terms of worship of Zeus. Um, in the entire city is predicated. This is the the guts of our city. Oh, the anus. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the anus is uh, a couple other places. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna head up this very dark road. So I'm gonna go first, and I'm gonna have a flashlight like this. But everybody, just follow me. We're gonna stay to the side of the road. Underneath the Greenpoint Bridge. So we're going to walk down toward where they're uh, going to be a little more active. And along the way, we're going to be talking about what's, uh, what you're going to see. These are the lower Montauk branch tracks of the Long Island Railroad. 
These tracks were first driven through all the way to the East River back in 1870. At that time, Long Island City had, didn't exist. It, this neighborhood was called Blissville. Um, Blissville, along with Astoria, Hunter's Point, and several other communities all along the East River in Queens, succeeded from a colonial entity called Newtown. Newtown stretched halfway into Nassau County, and they succeeded away um, and in the same year that the Long Island Railroad drove its tracks through to the East River. They created an industrial paradise down here that was fairly far away from where people lived. Therefore, a lot of the industries that were based down here ended up being really, really um, less than scurious in terms of the game. Let's head down this way. We'll kind of stay to the left side of the street and please watch your step. The road is very broken up. Underneath the Greenpoint Bridge. back in 1870. At that time, Long Island City had, didn't exist. It, this neighborhood was called Blissville. Um, Blissville, along with Astoria, Hunter's Point, and several other communities all along the East River in Queens, succeeded from a colonial entity called Newtown. Newtown stretched halfway into Nassau County, and they succeeded away um, and at the, in the same year that the Long Island Railroad drove its tracks through to the East River. They created an industrial paradise down here that was fairly far away from where people lived. Therefore, a lot of the industries that were based down here ended up being really, really uh, less than side of the street and please watch your step. The road is very broken up. Underneath the Green Point Bridge. So we're going to walk down toward where they're uh, going to be a little more active. And along the way, we're going to be talking about what's uh, what you can see. These are the lower Montauk branch tracks of the Long Island Railroad. These tracks were first driven through all the way to the East River back in 1870. At that time, Long Island City had, didn't exist. It, this neighborhood was called Blissville. Um, Blissville, along with Astoria, Hunter's Point, and several other communities all along the East River in Queens, succeeded from a colonial entity called Newtown. Newtown stretched halfway into Nassau County. And they succeeded away um, and at the, in the same year that the Long Island Railroad drove its tracks through to the East River. They created an industrial paradise down here that was fairly far away from where people lived. Therefore, a lot of the industries that were based down here ended up being Stay to the left side of the street and please watch your step. The road is very broken up.
started in 1894. And it started when Manhattan began to get rid of the businesses it didn't want and the people it didn't want and started sending them out here. Saying that Manhattan looks real good.
Thanks for listening. Um, so a little bit about me, um, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Johan, as Mark mentioned, um, and I've been playing with technology all of my life. Um, this is a photo of me uh, from the local newspaper where I grew up. Uh, the quote says that I'm putting a program through its paces. Um, I was in one of those gifted classes in elementary school. We were the first few that got to be exposed to computers as an, at an early age. And all I remember is getting to play with a lot of video games, basically. So when educational software came out, we were the first to try, and it made a really huge impression on me. Since then, I've continued this thread of experimenting with technology and music and sound for creative means throughout my life as a way to be amazed at the world, express myself, teach, and connect to others. In this photo, I'm teaching a workshop on, on showing people how to build um, small preamplifiers that could be used for mobile listening kits. Um, I'm an artist, engineer, musician, that, and I make installations, performances, and sculptures in open source hardware and software for experiencing the world through Sonic Encounter. I surface resonant histories of past interactions inscribed in material and embedded in space, peeling back vibratory layers to reveal hidden memories and untold stories. I share my tools and techniques to others through listening tours, workshops, and open source hardware and software that I'll be talking a lot about. And I've always wanted to center the embodiedness of technology and move away from screens and what I refer to as office gestures, you know, click, drag, control, copy, control, paste, all the kinds of gestural limitations um, that we have in front of us when it comes to manipulating and producing sonic and musical pieces. Um, I feel that we've kind of been relegated to the kind of gestural um, affordances that, you, that, that are more akin to editing an Excel spreadsheet than uh, really kind of attending to the larger um, uh, possibilities that, that, body, that the body and bodies um, affords. So instead, I wanted to highlight the fact that interacting with technology can be an activity brimming with expressive potential between people, their bodies, and the environment around them. So I've been working through this for quite a while now. Um, so what I want to show is what might be a first attempt at making a musical interface that attends to the body and encourages play. Um, this is um, from almost a decade ago when I was back in grad school at the ITP program at NYU. Um, this was for a class called NIME, which is named after the conference you might be familiar with, New Interfaces for Musical Expression. And this was a first week uh, assignment where we were just asked to um, make a novel musical instrument. So this is what I came up with. Um, it's called You and Me in a Vacuum.
Uh, so since then, I've created a sonic and research and engineering studio called A Quiet Life, where I design and build audio related software and hardware products for revealing new sonic possibilities off the grid. Uh, the first project from this studio is a musical instrument called the Harvester. Uh, the Harvester is a handheld synthesizer and sampler that lets you play music with your breath. And it's an open platform that encourages new musical possibilities for yourself and others. Um, it's in the form of a handheld sam sampler and synthesizer, as I mentioned. I also have it on my desk. You see this like tiny video. We can talk about it more later, but um, this is what the Harvester looks like. Um, you can also see this image on the screen. Um, you can customize it to make music of everyday sounds. Uh, the Harvester allows you to record sounds from around you and play them back in a musical scale, allowing for a rich um, palette of wild, wildly expressive um, sounds and possibilities. More importantly, the instrument is spatially aware, so it allows you um, to affect its sonic output by moving the instrument in three planes of axes. So you can pitch it, you can roll it, you can yaw it, You can see some of the PD sliders moving as it moves around. And um, so here's a, I'm gonna show a video of me musicking with the harvester out by the Everglades, um, which is, I guess, like a, a big swamp national park area in, in Florida. Um, this is behind my home in Florida, in South Florida, where I grew up. Important was for the ability of the harvester to bring the best of digital technology to the outside world. No longer do we need to chain ourselves to our desks or be confined to the studio to leverage the advancements made by digital electronic music. We can reveal new sonic possibilities off the grid through both resisting the grid of digital audio workstations and also the grid of conventional life, bringing digital electronic music to places and environments like never before. The Harvester is completely open source. Um, there's some, a few photos of me teaching Harvester workshop at Somerset House um, in 2018. Um, so it's open source from the hardware down to the software, allowing for people of all abilities, skills, and backgrounds to customize the instrument to their own liking. Um, someone can buy a prefabricated instrument or dive into the deep end and build it themselves or with others from the ground up learning the ins and outs of tool, instrument tool making in the process. Um, these are a few photos from a workshop that I did at Pioneer Works um, 2017, 18, um, where I had people building these sound monsters um, where they were designing and building analog noise circuits and then decorating them with uh, pom poms and googly eyes and glitter and acrylic paint to make uh, cacophonous creatures of their own imagination. Um, and along, you know, following that kind of similar trajectory, the harvester, um, the vision of the harvester is to provide an easy way for people to build, play, and interface with musical technology. The harvester provides an accessible platform for a new generation of experimental sound makers uh, that are underrepresented in and intimidated by musical technology. Um, I want to help people develop a new re relationship to playful musicking that incorporates our larger world and environment. Um, 
And this photo is uh, me and my longtime music uh, collaborator, Kaylee Staples. Um, we performed together, played music together as Glass Salt. Um, and we use the harvester pretty extensively in our work, which we'll be diving a bit deeper into um, shortly. Ultimately, I envision a world where liberated access to creative expression leads to better well being for people, society, and our planet. So, um, I'm going to move to a, another section in this talk where I want to um, dive a bit deeper into um, some of the work that I've been doing. And in order to do that, we're, we're going to be kind of doing three things for the remainder of this talk. One will be we'll be listening. So we'll have another extended listening period shortly. Um, and through that, I want to kind of outline or follow a trajectory or a line of thought as I've been um, putting together some writings around a theory of sonic encounter. I've been looking back at my own past body of work and kind of teasing out some of the, um, the elements um, that keep reoccurring that I think um, help to flesh out this theory. So we'll be following that trajectory. And then towards the end, um, I'm hoping that we can all be in study together and talk about this theory of sonic encounter um, as I have been thinking and writing about it and we'll present to you all and um, we can kind of you know, share some of our thoughts together. So we'll look at some past performances as examples and case studies and tease out a potential proposal for an approach to performance, which is what I'm referring to as this idea of sonic encounter. Um, so the theme of this talk from now onwards will be about kind of unpacking this idea of sonic encounter and thinking about what does it make possible and what are the stakes um, by defining it and implementing it as a as a practice. So within my work, um, I think of a, a big a one large area of my work is, is concerned around sonic and musical um, performance and, and the practice of that. And the elements within that um, include both music, or not both, but include music, which broadly speaking is meant to just be uh, an evocative and emotional space, depending on a certain kind of affect that I'm interested in um, producing and transmitting through the work. Um, threading in conversation, which is my practice of documenting an oral history and being able to include that into my work. And then also sharing that out to others um, to, to learn and hear about the, these histories. And then parentheses fields, like you know, recording in general, um, what that means to bring in field recordings into work as a way to engage with sonic history and in sonic archive. So I'm going to be, um, I'm, I think we're going to spend most of the rest of this section um, focusing in on uh, a work that I produced with Kaylee Staples as Glass Salt this past summer as um, residents at Way Farm. Um, the work is called Celeste. Um, this is a photo of myself and Kaylee. I know Kaylee is in the room. So Kaylee, if you're there, say hi. <laughs> um, I see you there. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, we were residents at uh, Way Farm this summer um, producing this uh, new work called Celeste. And um, Celeste is a new radio, uh, so Celeste is a radio art piece by us, Glass Salt. Um, we're an experimental music duo. And we, uh, the both of us obviously collaborated and made the work together, but also in collaboration with the radio transmission frequencies floating in the sky, the celestial sphere and deep space. Um, so the call for these residencies were on the duo and on uh, um, you know, bringing a duo together to make a work. And so we decided to engage with um, two opposing ends of the electromagnetic frequency spectrum, the very low frequencies in the atmosphere between three and 30 kilohertz, um, which are picked up by this middle, uh, this image in the middle, which is of a VLF receiver, which can um, um, sonify atmospheric um, vibrations and, and emissions. Um, as well as um, the cosmic gamma radiation emitted from stellar radio sources at frequencies above 30 exahertz, which for us was a way to engage with um, pulsars, which are kind of like these cosmic metronomes in the sky. Um, so this combination of both us as a musical duo and this duo of extreme ends of the frequency band 
allowed for the creation of an adventurous new radio artwork that brought together the, uh, the unhearable into the range of human listening and performance. Um, Celeste was both composed and broadcast during the annual Crusade Meteor Shower, which brought over 100 shooting stars per hour to the night sky. And I think it's kind of set in a very appropriate stage for our, um, as a celestial backdrop for our engagement with the skies above. So um, for the next, I would say 20, 25 minutes, we're gonna listen to um, Celeste um, kind of from the beginning. Um, we're gonna hear kind of the uh, big musical piece at the beginning. And then towards the end of this, we'll hear an interview with me, my, um, myself, Kaylee, and my dad, um, who has a lot of interesting anecdotes about early radio um, as he was uh, exposing to it in, uh, in Jamaica. So um, sit tight. Um, we'll be doing another like, kind of extended listening piece, and then we'll come back um, to talk more about Sonic Encounter. Here we go. You are listening to Celeste. We are Glass Salt. Up next is the Star Report. New moon. Sky was overcast, full of clouds. Stars were not visible this night.
You are listening to Celeste. We are Glass Salt. Up next is the Star Report. Small waxing crescent. The sky was bright and clear, with the air crisp and the stars visible. The Big Dipper could be seen clearly in the northern sky. No meteors were seen.
by like the like the sun and like the magnetosphere that produce these like atmospheric like clicks and pops and whistles. So I have mm-hmm. this like big like radio antenna kind of device thing that um, can pick those up. And then and then on the kind of the other side of the spectrum, pulsars like like the s- stars that are kind of like rotating really fast and kind of look like lighthouses or kind of behave like like lighthouses. They have a very constant rhythm to them in the sky. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of just like being inspired by those two extreme ends of the electromagnetic spectrum and, and making music with it or oh, like yeah. kind of based off of it or referencing it or being inspired by it yeah um that's kind of <laughs> it's, it's kind of a <laughs> and when i say it out loud i'm like that sounds like pretty <laughs> like out there but that's what we're that's what we're doing um pretty space out far out is that <laughs> something like firm? that yeah, yeah maybe <laughs> yeah literally um it also happens to be this me- this big meteor shower the Perseid meteor shower is happening this time of the year so um been lucky to see some like shooting stars and like meteors um and it should be the like this this time of the year there's just a, a ton of them because of this this like annual meteor shower that happens boy um, and and it's, fun, it's funny that you say that because you remember when you and I were having a discussion some time ago, we were talking about while, you know, I was back in Jamaica and we were communicating yes. on ham band, you know, 11 meter, yeah. even CB frequented, the same electromagnetic um, phenomena that you're talking about, mm. it actually creates like a, like a, uh, a like a ceiling then so to speak in the sky and that it makes long distance radio communication you know um, much more effective at this time mm-hmm. than most other times uh, you know for short we, we would call it um, skipping <laughs> yeah uh, because typ- typically you know say from Jamaica to the United States here, you can't get a, you know, the, the, the CB signal wasn't normally powerful enough to go direct. So what would happen that we would set our beam antennas, you know, in, in certain directions where we would bounce off these electromagnetic magnetic, um, radiation spots mm-hmm. that the sun, you know, created, and then it would, you know, send it a little bit further. So it would like would skip, you know, over to Louisiana or you know Kentucky or you know some of those some of those states. So right, that is real. You know that is actually real. I mean, day night, it didn't, it didn't even matter. But um, interesting mm-hmm. that you you know you talk about that. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Well, yeah. I mean, Okay, y'all, coming back up for air. Just fitting that out. Thank you for listening. Um, towards the end of that, um, we're, we're hearing a conversation between myself, Kaylee, and my father um, as he's talking about um, radio skipping and, and sending um, radio transmissions from Jamaica um, at very, very far distances throughout the world um, uh, through this like uh, appropriation of this really interesting atmospheric uh, phenomenon. If you want to listen to more of that, you can check it out on Wave Farm's uh, website. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, move to another uh, piece um, that also includes my, my father, including conversation and oral history um, and field recording and, and music composition. Um, this work is called uh, A Choreography of Sinks. It was uh, performed or, or shown or, or made, made audible at uh, ICARA. Uh, the Center for Art Research and Alliances in New York City. And this is a, a kind of work that for me has been kind of thinking about, am I doing performance? Maybe, but I think really what I'm doing is creating listening rooms. And so um, this, uh, this, this is a scan of a one sheet that was printed out and distributed for the performance, um, produced uh, lovingly by Katie Gorillian. And um, I'll just read the description of the work. Um, a choreography of sinks braids together original musical composition, field recordings, interviews, readings, and autonomous soundings, sound objects, sounding objects in order to hold space for erratic sonic encounter to arrive. 
interweaving sonic events that run on clocks of their own. The performance is threaded together with a free flowing interview between the performer myself and um, my father, tracing memories of Caribbean meteorology in the form of the hurricane, aquatic revel revelry in the form of the swim, and interspecies slash generational communication through wind in the form of the whistle. Through a soft embrace of unpredictable cycles, a choreography of sinks whisks past memories with present offerings to transmit yet to be heard reverberations for curious listeners. Um, there's a, I guess, a bibliography, what we would call a reading room towards the bottom of things that I read during the performance, and then a, a poem on the back of the, the one sheet. What I'm going to do is play a, a four minute clip of parts of the performance where you'll get to hear again my dad. Um, he and I are having a conversation about um, whistling and how he learned to whistle or where his whistling kind of came from, um, along with my whistling, um, some field recordings of birds in Jamaica. Um, I think those are the main objects. You also see some glimmers of some of the autonomous sound objects in the form of these um, uh, pinwheel flowers. <laughs> yeah, so that's okay. So um, as I wind down this talk and get to this last section, um, maybe bring us a few minutes over the hours just to give you a heads
heads up. Um, I wanted to um, both, I guess, close down the talk, but also open up like a, a lot of questions and uh, maybe like a pretty expansive, vast field for conversation um, around this idea of sonic encounter. And so I want to develop a theory around a strategy, a mode, and a destination, or maybe a starting point around what I'm calling sonic encounter. In some ways, this is a compositional approach similar to intentional assemblage or sonic bricolage, seeking to find resonances and affinities between sonic events and elements. This process is fundamentally included as a major player, sorry, this process fundamentally includes as a major player the environmental elements that are outside of our control of the performer and further, in, in ter, um, and further integrates these elements into the process as a source of sonic material, inspiration, generative constraint, guide for direction, and other roles, responsibilities, and expectations. What's at stake is a process that expands our periphery for encountering the surprising, a proposal to extend our curiosity, and especially for me, a mode of practice that gets us away from screens and, again, the banality of office work gestures, and back into our bodies and the spaces we inhabit. Said another way, what is at stake is the very means by which we create in and with the world around us. We've limited ourselves into the screen and the grid, and, and this theory of sonic encounter is a proposal for a way out off the grid and into something else that is more alive and present. To those ends, I will also well, be, you know, be talking about presenting some evidence for sonic encounter along the way to further demonstrate its qualities and potentials. Sonic encounter is a process and an approach. It creates space or a room to invite in a present moment into our sonic field of perception, letting mess and synchronous and asynchronous events to transpire and play out in a surfacing of unexpected and surprising relations to have an opportunity to meet. It allows for the arrival of not just the unheard, but the never before possible to be heard, to become audible. It's a soft game, a kind of rigorous play, to use the words of writer Mira Dial. It's a rigorous play of permutation where elements encounter each other over time, layer on top of one another, and from which appear new relationships and possibilities for sites of inquiry, as well as for refuge, safety, and shelter to grow and flourish. This practice of sonic encounter and its ability to allow us to hear off the grid excites me as it provides an alternative to gridded listening that we've grown accustomed to and take for granted. As I've shown, I've been thinking about how to get away from screens and contemporary human computer interface design as a way for music production and a sound art practice um, through performance and installation. I know I wanted something that attends to the scale and interaction possibilities of the body, and it became a launching off point to consider the multi-layered presence of sound in a space and all of the unpredictable elements that did already or could occupy that space. To those ends, I've, I invented the harvester to be a tool to help facilitate and assist in fulfilling this desire for encountering and playing with the new sonic and musical possibilities off the grid. By that, I mean away from this grid of the screen, the DAW of the rectilinear gray black box and into an interface that calls in, invites mess and play into its very nature, gives us a heads up and ears out experience, lets us move around, reminds us of our body and invites it in, and is fundamentally surprising and unpredictable as it is always informed in responding to the environment and other elements of sonic encounter. This has developed for me an approach where I start with the harvester by first listening, finding a tone, and gathering it into the harvester to begin playing, um, thinking of listening as an origin point. So some of the elements of Sonic Encounter that I'll talk about are sonic elements, sonic events, performers, which I think are interior to this space of Sonic Encounter, the environment, which I think think of as exterior, but I also think it's very much integrated into the space of Sonic Encounter relationships and context, a context, which I'm thinking about as a listening room, a listening room being a, a specific kind of context in which um, Sonic Encounter can, can arrive. 
Um, but I want to kind of just take a step and back and kind of talk a little bit about encounter to begin with. And one which that I've arrived at this theory of sonic encounter has been through my thought partnership with artist, educator, and publisher Katie Gerritlian, who I, I believe is also in the room. Hi, Katie. Um, we began to think about um, sites of capture, sonic or photographic, as previously conceived of as a singular point or an opaque dot that's on the left hand side. We started to think about how we could begin from this point and expand out through our respective areas of inquiry, the photograph and the sonic recording and see how they were, could be expanded upon through this idea of encounter. So starting at this point, looking at photography and sound through this idea of encounter and then seeing what kind of new emerges from um, kind of filtering it through that or passing it through that theory. Katie pointed me to the scholarship of writer Ariella Azulai and her transformation of the, photo the photographic object into a site of encounter. So I'm gonna read a, a quote um, from Azulai. Um, Azulai writes, in photography, and this is evident in every single photo, there is something that extends beyond the photographer's action and no photographer, even the most gifted, can claim ownership of what appears to be in the photograph. Every photograph of others bears the trace of the meeting between the photographed person and the photographer, neither of whom can, on their own, determine how this meeting will be inscribed in the resulting image. The photograph exceeds any presumption of ownership or monopoly in any attempt to be exhaustive. Even when it seems possible to name correctly in the form of a statement what it shows, this is X, it will always turn out that something else can be read in it some other event can be reconstructed from it. Some other player's presence can be discerned through it, constructing the social relations that allowed its production. So I feel like taking and looking at Azulai in this quote, we can kind of apply it to the sonic realm into field recording and think about how we can expand this opaque dot of the recording into something a bit more expanded and relational. Um, just dropping some other things that might be of interest to others who are working or thinking in this space, um, this, um, essay, um, Catch and Capture field, the Field and Recording and Field Recording by Paul Haggerty um, from his book, um, Annihilating Noise, um, gives a really nice deconstruction of, of field recording and, and perhaps expanding it outwards. Also, I'm um, going to plug Mark's new book that just came out called uh, Listening After Nature. I just arrived in the mail yesterday. I had to um, uh, restrain myself from reading it last night before this talk so that it wouldn't completely uh, scramble my brain and, and, and force me to rewrite everything that I've been preparing. So um, I'm very excited to check this out um, um, after this. Um, and so coming back to this diagram, um, this oh, the opaque dot, this singular point, um, we're, we're thinking about considering the artifacts of recording as a single dot, um, as an opaque dot, and kind of going back to what Azula is saying and then thinking about just this, this, this site of mediated recording um, as, as a point, we can think about this point containing the recorded, the recorder, and the recording. And in the case of photography, this would be the photograph. And we can kind of construct this sentence that reads, the recording is produced by the recorder to contain the recorded. And so what are the stakes for trying to break this down and, and expand it outwards? Um, Thinking about the site of me technologically mediated recording um, is a privileged dynamic in institutionalized practices of documentary and technologically mediated practices that reinforce logic of containment, capture, and extraction. And I think Katie and myself are both very much trying to move away from uh, this idea of, of thinking about this engagement with um, the world and everything else um, through containment, extraction, um, in capture. So instead of theorizing about sonic encounter and moving outwards, we are thinking more about this site as being more about relational elements and enmeshed agents that contain elements, events, relationships, and contexts. And this is more now of a thinking about this as a dynamic network of relationships that contain a multitude of elements that relate to each other or blank with each other, depending on what those relationship dynamics are. Um, and I'm looking at graph theory from computer science and the way in which it 
kind of schematizes these relationships as nodes and edges, um, but also what holds and contains and influences that graphs. So it's kind of dropping from that seed and, and seeing where it goes. So I've been wanting to take some more time to think about and theorize what Sonic Encounter is, what this mode affords, what's at stake, and how it can be useful as an approach to a practice. For me, Sonic Encounter allows for an expansive sonic and musical practice through which, um, through the ways in which the framing allows the insight in. Many contemporary sound and musical practices are preoccupied with designing closed systems, fixed ideas, and a rigid articulations that don't allow for the surprising, the unintentional, and the strange um, to make its way in. We'll get back to the strange in a second. Digital born creations that exist only in silicon, noise, noise canceling headphones, and hermetically sealed studios are constructs that work to seal off, create thick boundaries, and discourage or even prevent the outside influence of unruly reverberations to enter our sensorium. If only the world were so pristine, right? Um, so Sonic Encounter kind of deals with more than, of the messiness that um, I think is actually um, what we have to, uh, in front of us. Sonic Encounter presents a different approach where there's a certain kind of calling in and intentional engagement with attunement to and all vibrations external to the site of sonic production that very much become elements that inspire, shift, inform, nudge, and overall impact the kind of work being made. Um, so this enmeshment is further explored in Brandon LaBelle's essay, Acoustic Spatiality, uh, which came out uh, last January, or 2021 of January. Um, LaBelle describes this mesh as a blending of material and immaterial, a vibrant interweave where sound and space are coupled. I'd like to open up this idea in the context of sonic and music generation um, as, a, as an interweave of intentional sounds generated by the artist or performer and the unintentional sounds present in the particular place in which the performance is occurring. This for me becomes a practice that believes in and calls out for what, Bell what LaBelle describes as the promise of strangeness. Throughout my work, there's always been a desire to come into contact with that strangeness, to find a slit in the air to press my ears against and to hear something beyond the human and the recognizable, to quote LaBelle again. And through that hearing, open up a new pathway for sonic and music generation that pulls and pushes me into modes of production that I would not have never engaged in, if not for an approach that leaves encounter open for all possibilities to come into my range of listening and what um, Katie Ritley and sometimes would describe as that would help me, um, that would help for new possibilities to arrive. So in what I'm writing and thinking about, um, I want to tease out and present some examples of how this acoustic spatiality helps us to understand what a mode of son sonic encounter makes possible and how a framing and engagement of certain listening positionalities, as um, Dylan Robinson describes in Hungry Listening, can um, help offer new ways of coexisting with each other and the world, also to quote LaBelle. Um, in the essay, LaBelle um, describes with the work of Toshia Tsunoda, where attunement to the tactile vibrations of material and reverberations of Yokohama's port register the vibratory linkages and connectivity embedded within certain environments. One is able to listen to the here and there as vibrations at a distance become proximate and fully integrated into the close and immediate. A practice of sonic encounter takes these linkages, this mesh, as a starting point to produce, um, as a starting point in a productive condition through which strange, new, surprising, and off-the-grid generation can take place. Um, so to close out um, this talk, I'm going to come back to Glass Salt again. Um, and during our residency at Artscape Gibraltar, we had to confront uh, the realities of negotiating sonic space with other co-inhabitants of what was a former school which cited the residency and how this, the thin walls of this building, opaque to sight yet transparent to vibration, complicate distinctions of interior and exterior and how emergent use of that slippage can produce new generative needs. So I'm going to share three anecdotes. Um, so the first anecdote relates to a situation where we met one of our co-inhabitants who happened to be an infant child, Baby Nye. Baby Nye and their mother Angela made their way into our studio one evening after we had invited them to join us for one of our improv sessions. We typically play loud 
um, which is very speaking very loosely, but I think is relative to adult ears, we're playing to adult ears, which might be loud. But now in the presence of infant ears, we decided to play in a register that would be much more suitable to baby and I still developing ears as to not damage them. This attunement to a different kind of listening body resulted in us generating a new kind of sonic and music experience informed by a recognition, negotiation, and acceptance of this new element in the room, that of Nye's ears. So let's listen to and watch some of that session. Um, this next uh, short clip is um, going to be showing us kind of winding down the end of one of our improv sessions and, and I guess looking for a place to land, so to speak, uh, until we start to hear the footsteps of one of our neighbors um, walking through the hallway as they're about to approach our, our door. And you can watch us kind of respond to the exterior, broad interior into our improv session as we are, are kind of arriving at an end to this, this composition, um, this improv composition piece. Um, and so at some point at the end of this video or the middle, I guess, you'll see um, Kaylee kind of point to the wall. And as we kind of, you'll start to hear these soft footsteps approaching. Come in. Come in. Yeah. In the last video that I'll show from this, um, this kind of uh, case study pile <laughs> um, around Sonic Encounter is um, us um, moving our um, improv music making sessions from the, the classroom to the beach. Uh, we're near Lake Ontario. And so this session has us um, playing music and integrating and responding to um, all the kind of different environmental elements at play 
um, including the sounds of the shore, um, planes overhead, people walking by us, et cetera. Um, maybe not shown in this video, but there's definitely um, an element in here where I'm responding to the waves as a kind of rhythmic metronome for some of the playing that I'm doing. Um, so I'll play this clip. Um, so, um, thank you so much to sort of get us to the, the conclusion or end. I wanted to just share one last um, piece from that session in our time at Arch at Archive Gibraltar, where um, I had this very like deeply moving emotional moment in recording and making music with Kaylee. And um, it's gonna be hard for me to like recite the entire story so in, in the moment, but I was sitting in front of my mixer and my instruments, but my the harvester, um, which I was doing a lot of improvisational um, making music with whistling and kind of realized in this moment that I was channeling my father, like a lot of like, a lot of, a lot of things kind of arrived in this moment where I sort of realized that my musical and performance practice was very much influenced and directed in some ways from my dad. Um, both as someone who taught me about electronics and sound and audio, but also someone who taught me how to whistle. And um, I was very shook and was kind of just like reckoning with the ways in which my dad was also very much present in this room in, in that moment of making this piece that we're about to hear. And I just think about I'm, what I want to think about is how Sonic Encounter can be expanded, not just for what things are kind of materially present, but I think also maybe energetically um, uh, present in, in ways that I, I, I struggle to define um, this, this, uh, this, this multi-layered overlap of, 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 of different kind of times and temporalities weaving um, in and out that kind of um, coalesce into the singular moment of, of music and making and production. I'm still unpacking. Um, I'm, 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 I'm speaking to you very much live and extemporaneously right now about it. Um, so I'm going to show this piece uh, to kind of conclude, um, and then maybe you know we can kind of take it from there. But I'm um, just thinking about all the things that kind of work in this room um, and responding um, as I was encountering it.
So um, I think I'll just end on a ellipsis and a question mark, which is to say that I am still looking for paths forward in my own work um, and in conversation with others um, to kind of unpack and think about this idea of sonic encounter as it were, as it plays out in my practices and other practices for within this community. So I'd be delighted to open up the space and have a conversation around these ideas and more. Um, I just want to um, give a very special thank you to Katie Garitlian, um, Mira Dial, um, the writing of Brandon LaBelle and um, Ariella Azulai and others, Katie Staples, or Kayla Staples was in the room, uh, Josh Rios, um, who's not maybe here, but um, is someone who I think of as a, a inspired me so much. Um, and to the larger community, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, Christoph has been uh, a source of inspiration um, and, uh, for a very long time for me, and uh, I'm just very delighted to be here um, to be uh, in conversation with you all. Um, how you can reach out to me, um, you can email me. Uh, I'm also on Instagram, um, full name, first name, last name. Uh, these are the websites, you can take a screenshot. Um, and. Uh, Please reach out. I, I want to talk to people about this. I feel like there's such a small, it's a small, dedicated, intimate community of people who are, who are just like wrapping their heads around this kind of stuff all the time. And there's nothing more uh, delightful for me than to be in conversation with others who are thinking about this stuff. So um, I would love to be in conversation um, with all of you now and forever, <laughs> as long as I can. Um, so thank you so much again. And uh, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. Oh, uh, thank you, Johan. I, I mean, yeah, I think that that was incredible. <laughs> and um, it's funny, you know, like when you come to a sort of question and answer scenario or a conversation, you, I, I sometimes think words fail in many ways and um, we will have a conversation. We will do some of that. But I, I just, yeah, just thank you again. Um, really, really incredible. Like, I, I went in all sorts of places, critical, poetic, like reflective, having a sort of encounter in my own space right here and and there. And I think every, you know, you can see everybody is, I've never seen the chat so alive with like, just great stuff. So it's, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Do you, do you, we don't have loads of time, but do you need a break like for two minutes or something? I'm fine, I, 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 I'm, I'm here, yeah. Okay, I'm awesome. a little over time, sorry about that. Great. No, no, it's, it's wonderful. I think what I'll do is I'll just go through the chat. I'll just bring up the sort of comments and go through things and ask any questions. And then um, we'll we'll see where we get to um, after that. Um, so I think Robin asked a question. I think you answered this already, but you might want to say something again about it because it's really interesting. Um, Robin asked, what did you say the name of the sonic pulses from outer space were called and how did you record them? Um, do you want to read that back, uh, Johan? Or, yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. So we, yeah, so we were engaging with um, these very, very high frequency, like kind of at the very opposite end of the electromagnetic spectrum, gamma, gamma rays, um, and these um, are emitted by many different things in space, but particularly pulsars, which are these um, stars, former stars that have kind of collapsed. Um, and that are spinning very, very rapidly. And because of the, like their rapid spin and the, the magnetic poles, they emit um, gamma rays from their poles. And so they're called pulsars because they kind of operate like lighthouses. And if you're like using like a, some electromagnetic uh, uh, device to, to observe them, you'll see these kind of like these spikes in the way that you would see light from a, a, a lighthouse spinning around. Um, so the pulse from these stars um, gives them these pulsars. They're um, very regular. Um, they kind of they kind of can be thought of as like as clocks, like celestial clocks. And so people kind of use them as like timekeeping um, devices, I guess, or, or, or ways to kind of like uh, synchronize things using something that's very like stable um, in, in space. They range from like millisecond pulsars to second most pulsars. They're, they're very, very quick. Um, and so we were integrating this, these pulsars and, and this radiation that they emit as sort of like a, a cosmic metronome or a cosmic like, ryth like rhythmic inspiration for, for the work. So we brought in some recordings of pulsars, um, but also just kind of thinking like poetically 
um, about this idea of, of a, a kind of with rhythm section in this in the night sky. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just work, keep working my way down. Then, then we had um, this like incredible opening up of space with the, you know, listening to that that piece that um, Kayleen and yourself had done, and just heaps of comments and love. This is great. Da, 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 da. Like it keeps going. Um, I, I, Matthias, who was a a great master student, former master student, said, "I don't really want to leave this space," and it just maybe not a question for now, but it made me think about the space of encounter and, um, and, and also like not, well, maybe I will ask a question actually, like in terms of like um, not wanting to leave, like I don't think anyone wanted to leave. It was such a like stretched expansive moment of, of time. It made me think of like the sonic event as well. And this like unfolding of, of things when I was listening to that. And it's a question to you both in a way, it's like, and it might sound a little bit dull the way I put it, but how like how how did duration work in that piece for you in terms of like did it did it demand that long form duration like because I could have listened to that for twenty four hours and was it like yeah it's just a question about duration and 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 how that played in in that work yeah I I, I it's a it's. it's I appreciate the question. Um, it's, I think there are many, many ways to maybe answer it. Um, and maybe like the, the, the duller answer is something to do with just like recording, like, like putting together a piece constraints. Like it could have been an hour long. It could have been eight minutes long, but I think we kind of decided on, um, it's like 15 minute range as being like a nice, a nice space. The entire piece, the entire support Celeste is an hour long, made up of four different sections that are um, kind of um, spliced um, with these uh, radio call signs almost. When you hear us say, uh, this is Celeste, you're listening, Celeste, this is Assault, and we give sort of this, um, it's like whether the sky report of, of, a, of a, the celestial sky is, is looking like on a certain evening. Um, I guess I can say, and Kayla, I'd love to, if you want to, I know putting you on the spot, you don't have to say anything, but while you're here, it's nice. Um, I, you know, when we, when we perform together or play music together, we generally improv for about 30, 20 to 30 minutes. And I think that's, I'm going to like project a little bit, but I think that just has to do with like our bodily endurance. Like, I think we just, we make music to the point that we just feel like somewhat tired or exhausted, or like we just want to take a break. And it just seems that like the 20 to 30 minute range feels like where we've just like naturally kind of fit and, and, and where. It, so I'm thinking of like other music you know, composers or musicians who, for example, like operate at like the, 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 the space or time of the breath, right? So they're like, they're making music that is, that is considerate to human bodily constraints and how much breath a performer can or can't um, use in, in vocalizing, for example. Um, so I think there's, there's, you know, there, there, there are like lots of like interesting music technologies that kind of extend us beyond the scope of the body. And I think for us, we're very much like happy to be constrained by the body and happy to be constrained with like how much energy we have or, or how long we think a thing is not because of anything else outside of just like what it is we can bring and how much time and attention we can we spend on almost on a, on a piece together. Do you have any other thoughts, Kaylee? Um, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I think that's true, uh, what, what Johan's sharing. And also touching on a lot of what Johan shared in this presentation, I think the um, process of playing together in Glass Salt really has more of a feeling of being in an environment and being in a space. And so rather than something like being on a phone call and having a linear um, idea to express, it's more about noticing and it sort of has the same pace as watching like leaves blow in the light and sort of whatever we're observing in our internal and external environment has that more pace of something that is and gently um, 
expresses and then may slightly change, but the timeline seems to be a bit longer, sort of like how long you might be able to look at a sunset or clouds and how much change is of interest until that focus shifts. And our focus seems to be about a 20, 30 minute focus. Yeah, totally. And, and, and just, the, you know, I think that, that the dancers entering example was kind of a, a nice example to kind of like, we could have gone perhaps a lot longer, um, but I think just, just um, accepting what was happening environmentally and how that exterior was coming into our interior as a, as a, as an, un, as an unpredictable or unexpected cue to end was, uh, was really nice and, and kind of delightful and, and, and felt it felt like, like what was asked for in that moment in that, in that way. Yeah, that's amazing. We have a lot of people in, in here today who, who play together as well and play in different formations. And um, this is this is like what we talk about a lot. So it's really like amazing to hear, hear you reflect on this. Thank you. Um, Simon James asks, he says a really boring technical question, sorry. Um, what was the player you used in the gallery in the first piece? Uh, oh, yeah. Love, lo I, lo I love a boring technical question. So <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's do this. So this is, this is the work as it kind of exists. Sorry, my background kind of like. Um, and on the back, it's, it's, a, it's just kind of a very conventional um, MP3 player. It's, it's not, it looks like an iPod. It's not an iPod. It's maybe like a $20 device purchased on Amazon. Better or worse, um, hot glued. Oh, this is hot. Yeah, this is hot glued um, to the back of here. Um, has a little charger, and I just plug headphones into it. I have it on my wall over here. That I my little studio visits that usually happen. But yeah, that's sort of how it works. That's the magic. That's brilliant. It's great to see that. Um, where are we? Dilida J uh, <laughs> says, "Hey." Johan, thank you for the presentation. It was fascinating. We may have covered some of this actually, but I'm interested to know how electromagnetic frequencies are sonified in this way. What is the relationship between the real sound and the audible representation of it that the microphone produces? I hope you get what I mean. Yeah. So, sorry, I walked away for a second. Yeah, this is one of the devices. It's called a VLF receiver or a very low frequency receiver. Um, this one was made and produced by Stephen McGreevy. Maybe, maybe some of you know he um, um, does these recordings with his devices to listen to um, atmospheric uh, phenomena in the sky related to like these like um, spherics and chirp, chirps and whistles, whistlings, and also these dawn choruses. Um, so this this is I mean essentially like kind of just like down pitches these these. Uh, phenomena in the sky and makes it audible um, or nothing human can really touch. Um, nothing, I don't know if I have anything more dramatic to say about it, but it's just kind of listening for these electronic, electromagnetic chirps and whistles and making them hearable for us. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, we have like just tons of people saying how amazing and inspiring it is. Um, tons and tons of that so delicate incredible thank you thank you thank you pace of noticing i love that um can i ask a question about um going all the way back to the um Karelian waters piece of, that you showed which mm. i was like blown away by listening to this and thinking about field recording and land acknowledgement and um like these kind of ethical things that I feel really need to be driven into that practice. And, and so I, you know, my head was like, yeah. Um, and, and all these questions like, where am I really as well within these sort of situations and positionality and, and all this stuff. And, and then it, I was thinking about how, like, um, how we record and represent places, but don't necessarily condemn them to their, let's say toxic histories if there's been like a a really mm. uh, sort of pollution event or something like this um as part of its history and and to and to sort of 
find a kind of like life, hope and vibrancy within all this stuff, which I think like all of us are actually trying to somehow wrestling with this like thing of like the hope gap, which is often described as like this kind of gap in hope. And hope is maybe not the right word, but I think, you know, you know what I mean? So it made me think about all this stuff. And, um, and then I got to my kind of like, maybe this is my, my boring part of my brain, but I think it's interesting. Um, the, the balance of like documentary and um, sort of like spoken word, letting field recordings be, you know, these elements of like music field recording and voice and things. And, and it made me think like what, like basically a lot of our students are dealing with this thing called the audio paper at the moment. Final year students are, are uh, having a choice to do a dissertation, like a written dissertation or do an audio paper, which is like a, I guess like mm. a style documentary in a way. Mm. Um, what, where do you position that type of work? Is it like a sonic ethnography, an audio essay? Does that even matter to you? <laughs> sure, yeah. Huh. I, I, I don't have a clear answer. I think I am kind of grappling it with myself. Um, it's hmm, maybe it's close to like creative nonfiction might, might be like a good analogy of something that, that is rooted and it's and, and has an origin in, in a, a real or objective. Um, but it, but it, is is taken to some into some other kind of place um i i think i think it, it is trying to both be a, something that is documenting a history or documenting a present that i guess would then become a history right um injecting a bit of emotional or, or evocative feelings that 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 history how how it affects me or like what like how it how it moves me as well um and then towards the end of that piece there's just this this kind of like and very kind of somber droning with, with the rain and i think it's kind of like this responding to like the the uncertainty of, of the future of, of of the of this neighborhood and of that of that of that space of that environment um so it has a bit of an essay kind of form to it then too i guess in thinking about it out loud it, it is kind of like presenting an argument and then presenting some examples or facts and then and then thinking creatively of how to to to, to um, insert your own opinions or insert your own like uh takeaways from what it is you're listening to <laughs> It is in kind of a very messy space, so I, to I totally agree. It feels more than just field recording and more than just music composition. And it's 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 definitely it's it's a question that I think should it like should be like rigorously considered. I also am kind of like in a bit of a space now where I'm I'm less concerned with like prescribing what it is. And what will occur in the in how all those elements relate to each other, and more concerned with just like setting up the space for those elements to interact and 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 relate to each other. If that makes any sense. Um, so, like in, in kind of the the more recent work, um, especially the the a choreography of sinks, it had um, a lot of oral history. I guess you could say for my dad, or at least just like you know us like having a conversation and sharing stories, um, my own kind of musical composition that is in some ways responding to and, and giving some like evocative backdrop, which um, maybe isn't like the most conceptually rigorous, but I think is, is that's where like, I guess more like artistry or poetics kind of comes into it. And if I can say like the, my voice uh, gets into there. Um, as well as like doing some readings that go along with it and incorporating field recordings and really just seeing like how these things like layer up and like what new connections can can emerge from these elements kind of synchronizing or asynchronizing over time. And so in, in that in that piece, like you get to hear me trying to record a whistle into my sampler and right next to it is my dad whistling, like as he's reminding himself how he used to whistle when he 
uh, or how he learned to whistle when he was younger. And I think that kind of like temporal compression that happens in that in that moment is is like super interesting and like it just becomes like this like generative um, moment to think about like what does that mean and how do these connections take place and how do I relate to it? Just like the how the present is always in or how the past is always in the present and. Um, and maybe we can get some glimmers of the future for, for thinking of time literally in that way. Um, yeah, that's what I got, a bit of a rambling uh, answer, oh. but I hope that's helpful. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, actually, maybe on the back of that, Raul's asked a question. Um, we've gone over, but we'll, we'll just do a few more. Um, you use field recordings in some of your work. What is a field recording to you? That's a big question. Um, how would you define it? There you go, do that. <laughs> um, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> second question is, um, do field recordings become a catalyst to action, activism, change, or well-being for yourself? These are great questions. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try. I, I, I feel like a field recording is simply like uh, an artifact of an activity, and the activity itself is probably the most uh, important for 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 me singularly as a person. The act of of going out and walking and and slowing down and noticing things that I think are like very like. Um, typical um, to talk about in these kinds of conversations. Um, I'm really not that like interested in like the artifact of the field recording in and of itself as as some like thing to like pedestalize or 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 to to be like super focused around. I think like through field recording we get to like duck our heads inside of a sewer grate or walk on the edge of a polluted waterway or. Um, get really close to like ice, icicle crystals that are dropping into a, a lake. Um, it puts us, it like encourages us to get into some very like extreme and, and strange um, situations that I think just wanting to do the field recording helps facilitate. Um, I think <laughs> I think of it as like extreme field recording. There is just this one example where at, when we're out and and I'm in like Ontario kind of walking to the edge of this jetty to, to try to do some field recordings out um, where there's some like turbulent waves. And I was thinking to myself, like, if this is where I perish, I guess, you know, I was doing what I love. Um, but it kind of like pushed me to, to do something a bit extreme and a bit risky um, to really kind of get to know this place and, and this, in this area in a, in a way that I think had I not wanted to do the food recording in the first place, probably wouldn't have gotten me there. Um, I, I had a, a, I have a, another history in my practice of doing these mobile listening kit, um, listening tours, and people would always ask me, like, oh, you know, we take my contact microphones and listen to different kind of reverberations around you. And people would be like, oh, I'd love to record these. Or like, what do you do with these? Do you record the sounds of these? And like, the, report, I, I don't, the recordings are, Kind of bad they're like they're pretty terrible like they're not that interesting of things to actually listen to but the fact that like i've got like a group of people listening to like a garbage can or a mailbox or a fountain i think and, and like jump you know jumping over and and using the the environment in like weird almost performative ways that you normally wouldn't have considered is more of i think the reason why like i engage with field recording as a practice in the first place um the second question, I don't, uh, that's hard to say. I think there are actually some like really interesting examples of where field recording does the opposite of catalyzing action and uh, change and, and actually is like uh, further like propagating kind of like climate destruction. Um, but I think at the very least it does like give some awareness. I think maybe awareness is maybe like the most I can say that field recording does and gives people this opportunity to to come into contact, um, however, like one dimensional it might be, um, to a scenario or to uh, a condition of a site that you might not have known about otherwise. And yeah, maybe that does get people like, that's, that's, that's where you start, right? Um, but um, I don't know, there's, there's some like very dodgy, 
tricky like ways I've seen this trying to do that and I don't know if it is completely successful um I'm just thinking anecdotally of like those who go to extreme climates like uh the arctic circle to make recordings of um you know icebergs um defrosting and melting but um all of the the fuel that is used to fly out there and take a ship out there contributing to this, the thing that you are recording kind of makes it like like a, a weird uh a weird condition that doesn't really seem to be it seems to be more contributing to the climate um destruction in this in this context than than uh than anything else so i'm not too sure yeah it's, it's interesting i'm curious to know what we, you all think at chris about this this kind of um this uh this work, uh, or at least I'm, I'm reading what you all are putting out, and I'm very much like interested to think more about it. Great, thank you. Um, I think we might have to stop. You know, we've gone a little bit, well, a lot over time, and um, people have to go as well, and have started to go. So maybe, maybe we just draw that to a, a gentle conclusion, and um, yeah, just to say thank you so much again. Um, that was in really incredible, like really, really incredible. So thank you very, very much. Yeah. And actually, do you know what? Let's, let's like unmute ourselves and just make some noise because that was just really <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Please, please be in touch. Um, contact me. Love to be in conversation. And good luck with all the work you're doing. And I will be continuing to follow and look at this app for inspiration. Hopefully, we make it to London one day. And, and yes, let's do that. And, and traffic all of you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.